Hello everyone, welcome to TVC's First Wednesdays Biblical Thinking Series. Uh, normally we'd be doing this together, but as things are, this is how we're doing it. I'm in my backyard. My lovely wife is behind the camera. Thank you very much. Uh, tonight we're going to be watching a video called Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Uh, it's presented as a Q&A uh, with John Lennox, a longtime TVC friend. Uh, so enjoy. Thank you so much for joining us for this RZAM live event, a whole series of things which we're putting online during this time. It's wonderful to be able to speak with Professor John Lennox, Emeritus Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford, who has just written a book, Where is God in a Coronavirus World? Trying to address and pick up on some of the big questions that we have. Thank you to all of those of you who sent questions in and uh, posted them online. There are so many, we can't deal with all of them. We've tried to group them together into various different categories so that we can get the most out of John during the conversation with him. So. John, thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to have you. You're an author, speaker, writer, been a scientist all of your life. So we're very grateful to you joining us on the program and also giving this time available to us now. It's my great pleasure to be with you, Michael. So maybe if I could just lead with this question, just so we can jump straight in. Isn't atheism the easiest and most straightforward response to the situation we now find ourselves uh, all immersed in so deeply? It's a very common response. And uh, this pandemic raises that question in many people's minds. I got to New Zealand just after the earthquake. And that was a response that many people were talking about. This just shows us that this world is a random accident, ultimately, in the laws of nature. And so we should expect this kind of thing. And that's how it is. And Richard Dawkins has the famous statement about it saying, you know, as you look at it, it's just what you'd expect the world to be like if at bottom there's no good, no evil, no justice. DNA just is and we dance to its music. So that atheist response seems to many people to solve an intellectual problem. And in one sense it does, if it's true. That's just how it is and we have to put up with it. But there is a sense in which we need to probe this more closely because although it appears for many to be a solution to the problem, it doesn't remove the suffering. And in fact, it could be argued to intensify it uh, for the following simple reason. You see, if Dawkins says there's no good and no evil and no justice, then there's no point in complaining about it. That's just how it is. But because I'm a Christian, I probe a lot further. I have a real problem with it. But what I can see is that atheism removes any possible hope. And the hope dimension is something that Christianity has a great deal to say about, and we can discuss that and on. Mm. Do you think that's one of the reasons why we're struggling with this to such an extent? Because... As a society, we haven't thought in the West collectively about our mortality, about the challenge of this kind of situation for a while. Is that part of the reason why we're finding it so disorientating? Oh, I think it is. That we've never been in a situation like this before in any of our lifetimes. And it's on such a scale that Francis Collins, the director of the National Institute of Health, in the US, he says the, the thing about this that is so remarkable is the way it is transmissible. Things like SARS that we knew about, and that was scary enough, you had to be very ill to transmit it. But with COVID-19, you can transmit it without being aware of it. And of course, it has pushed a, a large proportion of the world into lockdown. Now, it clearly raises questions, as you say, about our vulnerability and our mortality. And these are things that have been ducked for a long time because you can't think of those two issues 
without beginning to think of God in eternity. And here in Western Europe, we've written God out of the Constitution. Nobody thinks about God anymore. And it seems to me that whatever else our reaction should be, we've got time in a lockdown situation to begin to raise the God question seriously once more. Now, there's been some speculation and we've been asking people to send in questions, um, knowing that this interview would be happening and that your book has just recently been released and made available. Uh, and some people are wondering if there's some kind of like cosmic karma principle at work here. Um, and therefore, we're simply reaping what we've sown. And that's why we find ourselves in this situation. Well, that's a very hard thing to judge. And the difficulty with the karma principle, talking about that is, it can end up being very cruel in the sense that in its extreme form, and I, again, I met it in New Zealand. People said, well, the earthquake hit people, it killed them. That means that they behaved very badly in a previous existence and they're being judged for it. And if we help them, we are then reducing their amount of suffering. So they'll have to suffer worse in their next existence. So it's an extremely cruel doctrine, and it is rejected very strongly in the New Testament by Jesus himself. Not all suffering, according to Christ, is a result of past sins. He says of the man born blind, he didn't sin, neither did his parents. So the karma judgment way of going is totally unsatisfactory. But of course, the, there is a, a Christianized version of this, isn't there? No, there is. And I was going to ask you about that, because we, we also have a whole string of questions about, well, is this God's judgment? Both in a positive sense, Christians wondering, is this what God is doing? And as a critique from atheism, well, this is the kind of crazy thing Christians believe. And so how can you possibly believe that? Which makes navigating that particular challenge uh, quite complex. Well, I think we need to navigate it because if we look at, at the Bible, which I'm going to look at a bit in our conversation because it's my guideline, we do find some plagues there. And we are told, uh, particularly the plagues uh, in the ancient world, we are told that they are God's judgment. Now, if God tells us in scripture that a particular plague or pandemic indeed was a judgment, then we have his direct word for it. But so far as I know, we don't have God's direct word on COVID-19 or even the Black Death. Now, what do we do in that case? I think what we do is to see exactly what position Jesus himself took on this issue, Michael. And there is a famous short paragraph, the Gospel of Luke, where the Lord is on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, and the crowd remind him that in that very place, there was an awful massacre where Pilate mingled the blood of people uh, offering their sacrifices uh, and, and killed them. Now, that is what we often call that raises the problem of moral evil, the bad things that people do to one another. But then Jesus turned around and he refers to a tragedy that had happened at the pool of Silwam in Jerusalem where a tower had collapsed. It had just collapsed and killed 18 people. And the Lord made the point, and here's the important thing for us to take on board because it's a deep principle. He said, do you think that the people who were massacred or the people on whom the tower fell were sinners above all other sinners. I tell you, no, but except you all repent, you should all likewise perish. Now there are two things there. Firstly, he's saying clearly that not all tragedy results from one group of people being more badly behaved than others. So I take that extremely seriously. We must be very careful before we ascribe pandemics or anything else to the judgment of God. Now, what I've observed is that there may well be a message in it 
Because think of what Jesus goes on to say, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And C.S. Lewis wrote this once, we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains, it is his megaphone to rouse a dead world. Let me just say two more things. Firstly, suppose someone says, whether they're Christians or not, that COVID-19 is directly caused by God. How do people react to that? Well, I know how they react because I've heard them. They say, who do you think you are taking an arrogant moral high position and saying this is the judgment of God. What a right have you to do that? Now notice, their focus is not on God at all. It's on the person making the allegation. They don't consider what God might be saying through this. In other words, they bypass the very message one would like to get across. So that way, it seems to me, is not the biblical way. The biblical way is to say, look, what can we learn from this? Is this COVID-19 a megaphone shouting at us? And I think it is. It reminds us of our vulnerability, of our mortality, of the God question, and of the fact that one out of one of us is going to die. And if there is a God, we have to meet him. Those are the big issues. So we don't need to make judgments since we don't know. What we can do is say, what is God saying to us here? Now, there have been other people at the same time making the kind of comment about saying, look, this isn't the kind of thing where we should be seeking intellectual answers. Um, uh, and I'm assuming you don't believe that you have all of the, of the answers yourself. So there's a motivation in writing your, in your book and trying to address it. So I'm wondering if you could just speak a little bit into that for us as well. Is, is this the kind of question we should be asking? Well, I'm so glad you said I don't have all the answers because I certainly do not have all the answers. And um, I'll be honest with you and everybody else who's watching. This is the hardest question that any of us face. And to offer simplistic answers is worse than hopeless, actually. Now, you mentioned something very interesting, and that is we react temperamentally and psychologically very differently to this. And again, uh, and it's one of the reasons why I believe that Christianity is true. It deals with this differential diagnosis. Some people, like me particularly, need intellectual answers. But then, Michael, I'm not suffering at the moment. I'm an observer of suffering. And it's awful to see, and I have such admiration for our health services and people who are mucking in and taking huge risk with their lives. But I'm observing it. There are people suffering it. And an intellectual response isn't necessarily the way to help them when their emotions are torn to pieces. So let's take those two things, the intellectual and the emotional. There is a story about a family tragedy, a very, in one sense, a small tragedy in John's Gospel. It's a, the story of a man called Lazarus and his sisters, Mary and Martha. Now, you might say, what's that got to do with a global pandemic? The answer is everything. Because, you see, the suffering in a pandemic consists of millions of small tragedies. And each tragedy for the family, that is their tragedy, that is their catastrophe. Saying goodbye to a loved one without being able to touch them and give them a last hug and say goodbye properly, that is horrendously emotionally tearing. So let's use this story in the small as a cameo to illustrate what's going on in the large scale. Jesus and his disciples were nowhere near where Lazarus and his sisters lived, and he fell ill. And the sisters, realizing that Jesus had been a frequent visitor to their home and he was very fond of them, just sent a message and said that Lazarus was ill. And of course, they expected him to come. And he didn't come. In fact, Lazarus died in the meantime. 
And it was only when he died that Jesus says to the disciples, let's go to Judea. They thought that was crazy and suicidal, but nevertheless, he went. So he arrives in the graveyard of Bethany. And Martha, one of the sisters, meets him. And she just very bluntly said, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, just think of that. What was the problem? His distance. He seemed utterly remote. He wasn't there. If you'd been here. And you could hear the cry of many hearts today on that level. God, where are you? Are you in self-isolation if you exist? Why don't you come near? So there's the issue of nearness. And because the Lord had remained distant and allowed Lazarus to die, that raised a very big question as to two things. One, did he really love them? And secondly, even if he did, had he the power to do anything about it? Those are the two big questions being asked today. So what does Jesus go on to say to her? Your brother shall rise again, is the first thing he says. And that is a wonderful encouragement, certainly to Christians like myself. He didn't just say Lazarus will rise again, although that, of course, is what he meant. But he was talking about relationship that has been forged during this life. Your brother will rise. There'll be something left of that relationship, the precious part of it, that will endure on into eternity. Now, that's a huge statement. Atheism denies that utterly by definition. How is that possible? And now Martha comes in with her high-powered intellect. She'd obviously read quite a bit of theology and been well taught. I know she said that he will rise in the resurrection at the last day. That was good Jewish biblical teaching. And uh, she paraded it rather proudly, I suspect. Now, this is within four days of Lazarus dying. She's not emotional at all. She's intellectual, philosophical, theological. And now Jesus comes in with something utterly new. I am the resurrection, he says, and the life. If a person believes in me, even though he dies, yet, shall he live? Well, this was utterly astonishing. And this begins now to show us why the story is in the gospel. It's telling us about the identity of Jesus, filling in what it means that he's the son of God. I am the resurrection. Well, what would that mean? What could that possibly mean? And um, it's about to be shown to us what it could possibly mean. And then Mary thinks, because she has a sister, breaks off the intellectual debate and goes and finds her sister and says, Mary, you know, the teacher's here and he's calling for you. So Mary stumbles out to the very same place, the graveyard. She's weeping copiously. And she says the very same thing as her sister. Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But it's now very different. Jesus is deeply moved by this when he sees standing there what death has done, uh, the process of dying and, and all of that has done to this little family. He sees uh, Mary weeping and what does he do? Enter into a long philosophical, no, he weeps. And this, Michael, shows me the profound sensitivity of God, if you like, but dealing with needs as they arise. Martha's need was to understand the nature of the resurrection and to learn something dramatically new. Mary's need was to see Jesus' tears. And in these days of, of COVID-19 tragedy, a hug, if we were allowed to do it, or a, a friendly touch, or weeping, would speak volumes to some people much more than any attempt to talk about resurrection or anything like this. And that tells me that this kind of answer, differentiated answer, has got such a ring of truth about it. 
Now, later on, of course, John, in his book of Revelation, is going to tell us even more that there's a new world coming. A world, a new heavens, new earth, in which there's going to be no crying, no pain, no death. And then it ends with this wonderful promise. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Now, you know, if either of us are crying, we normally wipe away our own tears because if anybody else tries it, they're likely to poke our eye and, and hurt us. The eye is the most sensitive organ in the human head. What sort of God is it who in the end will wipe away the tears? So here is the promise, and it is a spectacular one. But now to the reality. How do we know that Jesus can do that? And of course, he comes to the uh, grave and he says roll the stone away and Martha practical intellectual as ever said Lord he's stinking by this time I wouldn't do that if I were you and he said but didn't I say to you that if you believed you'd see the glory of God remove the stone and then in a loud voice he tells Lazarus to come right out of the grave and the dead man festooned no doubt with spices and the grave cloth stumbles out of the tomb and is seen by everybody to be alive. What a voice Jesus has. Now John has said earlier in his gospel so that we would get this that our Lord's voice is unique because it is the voice that will in the end operate the resurrection and therefore the promise for Christians is that if as he said to Martha, if you believe in me, though you die, you live. And he that lives and believes in me, or she, shall never die. And as my final point here, it's interesting to compare those two. Most of us will die, but there is a life, eternal life, that we can receive through trusting Christ in the here and now. That never dies. But then Jesus told his disciples later in the gospel that he would return. And of course, if we happen to be alive when he returns, we never die. So this new life that he offers through trusting him is not something we get in the last day after the judgment. It's something we receive, not by meriting it. None of us can do that. But by receiving it as a free gift, it's why Jesus died on the cross himself and rose again, or rather, more accurately, God raised him from the dead to prove that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. Sorry, that's a long answer, but it seems to me that this is a hugely important question. Yeah, no, it is. And I think that's, that's very, very helpful. Um, and we are much more complex human beings. We have that emotional side, psychological side, spiritual side. All of those things need to be addressed in a situation at a time like this. I'd love to come back to that one of those themes you just picked up there um, and ask a few questions about hope and also how we can cope as well with the situation. Um, but if I could backtrack just a little bit before going forward again to that, because uh, a lot of other people are asking questions, and I'm sure you've heard them as well. Well, why have viruses at all? I mean, what kind of God supreme being would design a world, a universe with those kinds of things in them? Yes, that's perhaps the most common question from skeptical and atheistic people. It goes back to David Hume, if the Scottish Enlightenment philosopher. If God is all good, then he can't be all powerful because he isn't doing anything. And if he's all powerful, he can't be good because he's not doing anything either. And so we argue, and we all did it, especially those of us who've been students, the midnight oil, asking surely a good God would, could, ought to have done this and that. Why couldn't God have made a world that doesn't fracture? Now, as I hinted earlier, there are two questions behind this. There's first of all, moral fracture, as happened when Pilate slaughtered those people sacrificing in the temple. But then there seems to be a concomitant breakdown in physical nature. So we get thorns and thistles. And this is a huge topic that the Bible addresses. And 
there are very deep questions associated with it, but sufficient to say what we observe is fractured moral nature and fractured physical nature. And so we asked, couldn't God make fire that heated but didn't burn and all this kind of stuff? And there's a trite answer to that. Let's take it at the personal level first. Could God not make creatures that didn't sin, didn't do wrong? Well, of course he could. We call them robots. And he could have made an automatic world, but then we wouldn't have been in it. And that's the problem, Michael. When we say, oh, we long for a world where none of us could do any wrong, well, there'd be no humans in it. Because the most precious thing about us is our capacity to choose. We're thinking of its negative side. But if you want to have love, then you've got to have a certain capacity to say yes or no. If you remove that and make us all automata, then no human beings in the world. So we're wishing ourselves out of existence. So what do I do with all this? I say we're never going to solve that question. Why? Because as we look now at physical nature, we see a mixed picture. I often call it beauty and barbed wire, but I might as well call it beauty and COVID-19. We see a mixed picture and no religion or philosophy that doesn't accept that will ever wash with the majority of people. So we've got to accept that. Now, I accept it. So what do I do? I say there's another question that needs to be asked. And that other question is this, granted that it's like that, which we have to do, is there any evidence anywhere that there is a God that we could trust with it? Now that's a huge thing to ask of anybody, especially now where we're asked to trust people. You and I are sitting locked down. Why is that? Because we trusted the government. We trusted the medical statisticians and epidemiologists. We're asking for people who will show real leadership and trust. And we encourage them and pray for them and all that kind of thing. And we've got to trust them. But is there a God whom we can trust with this question? that in the end we can leave it to him, not in some blind leap of faith way, but because there's evidence that he's trustworthy. Now this story that I've talked about, about Mary, Martha and Lazarus, gives us some insight into the heart of God. That is, if we believe, as I do, that Jesus is the Son of God. But the cross of Christ, which is the heart of Christianity, and we're talking at Easter time, it's the heart of Christianity. And this is, if Jesus is the Son of God, this is God suffering. This is a God who suffers. And what does it tell me? Well, at the very simplest reading of it, it tells me that God has not remained distant from our human suffering, but has himself become part of it. And then the hope bit, you mentioned hope. The hope bit comes with the fact that it didn't end there. If the story had ended there, we'd never have heard about it, nor would he have had the story of Lazarus. But God raised Jesus from the dead on the third day at that ancient Easter time, and that changes everything. In the sense, Michael, that it tells me that death is not the end. Now, of course, you and I know, and uh, there's loads on the RZM website and my website dedicated to the whole question of evidence for the resurrection. But just taking that, that to my mind is the fundamental key to everything to bring us hope. It's no guarantee that we won't die, die even of COVID-19. but it is a guarantee that those that put their trust in Christ rather than their own merit, they will one day, as Christ was, be raised from the dead. Yes. And I think that's, it's a fascinating point. Um, when we talk about losing something, we, we feel sad because we feel we'll never see whatever it is we've lost again. And that's what I guess we feel when we say we've, I'm losing someone or I've lost someone. 
But of course, this speaks a different message into that situation. What do you think are therefore the, if you like, the practical outworkings? If someone were to come and say, well, John, I actually, I'm a Christian, but I'm now wrestling with feelings of despair and fear. Um, uh, what are the things I could latch on to at this time? Or maybe share with somebody else who's open but asking questions. Um, I mean, you've already said so much into that, but are there a few other thoughts you have there too? Well, it's no accident that through the centuries, and remember, we've had pandemics before. We had the Black Death. There was no modern medicine. And if you go back even further to the plague of Justinian, and these plagues, we get it easily out of proportion, killed millions of people absolute millions of people. Now, we don't know in the end what COVID-19 is going to do, but we hope it's peaking in most countries fairly soon. So the world has been through it before, and Christians have faced it before. And it's quite, it's noteworthy, really, that a great deal of the comfort they got was from the poetry of the Old Testament, the Hebrew book of Psalms. And for people who are feeling fearful, and some of us are feeling fearful, it's important, I think, to read some of those beautiful psalms. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. This idea of the good shepherd leading the sheep and caring for the sheep and all this kind of thing. And I remember in New Zealand, uh, People using Psalm 46, I will not fear, though the mountains crumble and fall into the sea. It, it, it felt almost directly relevant to them. And in addition to that, what did Christ promise people who trusted him? He promised them forgiveness of sin, but he also promised them peace with God we may not have much peace with ourselves and we may be concerned about the epidemic and pandemic and so on. But to listen to Jesus say, in the world you have tribulation, you're going to have problems, but my peace I leave with you, not as the world gives. The world can't give us peace. It can give us medicine and we're utterly thankful for it. But deep peace, peace that transcends the fears and the death, is something that God is prepared to give us. And I think that openness of heart that's thankful for what we've got, if we've got anything, but opens to God's granting of peace in our everyday lives, in our relationships, and so on, that can go a long, long way. Because after all, Michael, fears are in our mind and in our heart. It's what's going on in our head. And we need to fill our minds, if I can put it this way, with something outside of themselves. Could I read just another little lesson from that story of Lazarus? Because it's fascinating. I missed it out completely. I said that Jesus had stayed in Galilee and allowed Lazarus to die. Now that is a very big statement, because you see, God, if there is a God, is still allowing people to die. And that raises deep questions, as we've seen, about his love and his power. Now, he let Lazarus die, and he stayed in Galilee, and then he suddenly said, I'm going to Judea. Now, They'd been looking for him up in Jerusalem to kill him. And the disciples said, you're crazy, absolutely crazy, man. It's suicidal to go there. And then he read them a lesson. He said something very odd. Are there not 12 hours in the day? If a man walks in the day, he doesn't stumble because he sees the light of this world. That is the sun in the sky. But if a man walks at night, he stumbles. And then comes the enigmatic, almost humorous statement. He stumbles because the light is not in him. Now, when I stumble out of bed in the dark of the night, sometimes I wish there was a light in me. And being an amateur astronomer, I often have a light affixed to my forehead, which does a good job. But Jesus is pointing to a profound thing. 
And that is, as we sit, we are profoundly dependent on a light that's outside ourselves. It's not only outside ourselves, it's outside our world. It's called the SUN, the sun. And our world spins around and we go from day to night. And if the sun were to be extinguished, that would be the end of life in a very few minutes. So what was Jesus saying to them? They thought it was suicidal going into the danger, the risk area. Keep your social distance, you see. Now, we have to do that today because it's vastly important to avoid infection. But Jesus was unique. He could go where the trouble was and not be infected by it. We can't. So he says, I'm going to Jerusalem. And they thought they should stay in safety. But you see, if they had, they wouldn't have learned that he was the one who could raise the dead. And what he was telling them was almost this, I think. Look, he said to them, where are you getting these ideas from? Is it inside your own head and your own brains? Or are you dependent on a light that's outside your world? And the lesson, of course, John explains elsewhere. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If a man follows me, he shall not walk in darkness. Christ is a moving light. And if I'm here and the light is there and the light moves and I stay where I am, I'll end up in the dark. So what he is saying is, we are looking, you and I, Michael, for light on COVID-19. Where will we get light on it? Well, I know of only one place that gives a satisfactory answer. I said before, I have no simplistic answers. But what I am trying to do is to point to a person who is himself the answer and will give us the illumination we need. And he did say, if a man follows me, he'll never see death. And that, that's exactly what the story of the raising of Lazarus and Christ's own resurrection tell us. John, thank you so much. That's been very helpful. I know your book is available both in print and also as an ebook. Um, it's available this week. It is uh, indeed. You have a copy and there. There's the very first copy of it. <laughs> ah, and, uh, and if I could, and we're allowed to, I'll drive around to your house and, <laughs> and pick one up from you. Um, John, is there, that's such a, a, a great place to land there, to find light in every sense, both emotionally, intellectually, spiritually, psychologically. We're, we're looking for some fixed anchor points. Um, I know as I, I, I read through your book, uh, which I found very helpful, by the way, uh, as you come towards the end, you make a little comment that Spurgeon made um, about, again, coming back to this whole theme of the trustworthiness of God. How do we trust him even uh, when we find ourselves challenged in so many ways? I don't know if you can remember that. He, he talks about uh, just finding The that, easiest way uh, to peace. remember it is to look it up. And make sure I, I get it abso absolutely right, because it is a lovely statement. So forgive me if I read it. God is too good to be unkind, and he is too wise to be mistaken. And when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. I, I think that's uh, fascinating. It comes from a faith, as you've been saying, that's born out of what God has revealed of himself and what we can know and therefore can rely on when we find ourselves caught up in a situation where there's so much we don't know. John, we're very grateful for your time and also for your insight. Well, it's my pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me on. If you're interested in John's book, it's available online as of Easter Monday, and it's also in approximately 20 languages and possibly even climbing. So it should be available right across the world. Thank you to you also for not only joining us, but also sending in your questions, which has made it possible for us to do this. And do look out for further events which will be coming out through RZM Live. We really hope that this has been of help to you. And we also pray that you all know God's peace during this time. All right, folks, I hope you appreciated what uh, Dr. Lennox had to say. Uh, some pretty encouraging items in there. Um, and here are just some uh, thoughts and reflections that I had uh, while we were watching that video together. Um, I like when he said that unlike atheism and naturalism, uh, in hard situations, Christianity 
actually offers hope. And not just some kind of amorphous hope, if you will, but the hope of uh, resurrection and uh, life after death. Um, so think about that and think about ways that we can relate that type of hope, both emotionally as well as intellectually, both two important facets, especially in this day and age. Um, another thought we had uh, was how pain can be used as God's megaphone. It's a classic C.S. Lewis concept and quote, um, why don't you reflect on the lessons that you can learn uh, through this time of pain that we're experiencing? Uh, how can you learn something individually and corporately uh, set within this kind of crazy predicament that we find ourselves in? And finally, consider what light you're dependent on right now. Is it your own internal light or is it the external independent light that is Christ? So to close, I want to remind you of that Spurgeon quote that Dr. John Lennox uh, had right at the end. I thought it was so powerful, uh, but he writes, when we cannot trace his hand, we must trust his heart. How perfect is that for a situation like this? Again, thank you for tuning in on this unusual first Wednesdays. Appreciate your time. Uh, we pray that God blesses you. I've been through these tough times um, and I'll say a quick prayer for you. Uh, dear Lord, Thank you so much for this uh, faithful group of people. Um, thank you so much for uh, the gentlemen on the recording as well. And more than anything, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy and your power, Lord. Uh, we pray that we'll see all those things on a daily basis. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Oh, come behold.